Hello, and thank you for joining us for a special presentation on how to best select station wear, brought to you in partnership with WorkRight Fire Service. Today's presenter is Derek Sang, Technical Training Manager for Bulwark Protection at WorkRight Fire Service. Derek has more than 25 years of experience in the flame resistant clothing industry in a variety of roles. He assisted in developing and implementing programs for some of the largest companies worldwide, helping garments comply to both NFPA 1975 and NFPA 1977. In his position as the technical training manager for Bulwark Protection and WorkRight Fire Service, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for Bulwark Institute, covering all aspects of flame resistant and arc rated clothing for both industrial markets and fire services. He has conducted over 250 seminars on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire for organizations all over North America, the Middle East and Europe. Derek is recognized as a subject matter expert on the proper selection, use, care and maintenance of flame resistance and arc rated clothing, a secondary PPE. He is also a qualified safety sales professional and a certified safety, health, environmental professional with the International Association of Safety and Health Professionals. In this webinar, you will learn about selecting station wear, how it should be used, and how to properly care for and maintain it. If you have a question at any time during Derek's presentation, please feel free to type them in and they will be answered during the question period at the end. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to all those registered within 24 hours. Thank you for attending and I will turn the presentation over to Derek now. Laura, thank you very much for that kind introduction and good morning, good afternoon, live or archived, however you are uh, consuming our webinar. First and foremost, let me sincerely thank you for joining us. And my goal today in 45 minutes is hopefully that you get something new and maybe start to shift the paradigm a little bit when it comes to what you wear under your primary PPE, uh, your turnout gear. So before we get started, let's get the legal stuff out of the way. Customers of WorkRight Fire Services are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessment to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of WorkRight Fire Services are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, WorkRight Fire Services does not make any representation that these garments and protective gear will protect wearers from injury. So on to the meat and potatoes. When we get outside of our little ivory tower and we get to go into the field and we get to talk to our firefighters, we get a lot of questions in and around station wear, what to look for uh, when selecting it, um, how to use it properly when we're utilizing it and then how to care and maintain it so that uh, we can get some return on the investment because this stuff, if you're using flame resistant station wear is not cheap. So what will you take away today? My, my goal is laid out here, but more importantly, it's thinking about the layers closest to our firefighters as being important. It's looking to the layers that are closer to our firefighters as being part of that PPE system and not just uh, a uniform, not just something that is, uh, you know, last second thought of, but purposely thinking of and utilizing as part of that systemic approach to uh, protecting our firefighters. A few definitions, most are all, I'm pretty much aware of these, but as we're talking today, uh, we'll reference the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. Station wear, that's non-primary work apparel and individual garments comprising work apparel. Polycotton, those are synthetic fabrics that, that will melt, drip, and add to injury if you're exposed to enough thermal energy. Uh, flame resistant, that's the property that allows garments to self-extinguish, does not support combustion, does not melt, drip, or add to the injury, and in many cases helps insulate. Turnout gear, that's the term we'll use. I know there's other terms out there such as bunker gear, et cetera, but that's your 1971, that's your structural ensemble. Uh, when we're looking at the hazards, we'll talk about routine conditions, 
uh, ordinary conditions and extreme conditions. Extreme conditions being flashover and extreme conditions is really where we focus on does what you wear underneath your primary PPE factor into injury or not? And then we'll also within the group of that, but we won't focus a lot on is understanding mayday, catastrophic events, entrapment, all fire ground activity, cease focus uh, for the firefighter rescue uh, in that area. So when I, as you listen to that resume that Laura uh, gave early, my primary of my 25 years, about 22 or 23 of it's been primarily focused in the industrial market. In the industrial market for the last 50 years, we've been protecting those that go into oil and gas, uh, oil and gas exploration, oil and gas refining, uh, electrical workers, utility, and also general industry. That's our core markets where we utilize shirts, pants, and coveralls to protect those against short duration thermal exposures. Understand their job does not include the word firefighter. They are utility workers, they are linemen, they are electricians, they are operators in a refinery where there could be an accidental exposure to thermal energy. It's not something planned. Uh, in our firefighter community, obviously it's inherently dangerous. We are, as firefighters, called upon to actually go into our working space, which is four to 800 degrees of thermal energy and apply our skill set. So the proper selection of PPE is very important. In fire services, that thermal hazards are way more obvious than in our industrial markets. Uh, and this has led to the evolution of excellent primary protection. If you look at the evolution of that turnout gear, that ensemble uh, from 50 years ago to where it is now, it is evolved uh, to where it is absolutely able to get and deal with those normal, quote unquote, working conditions in a fire environment. However, unintentionally, this evolution may have led departments to ignore how important station wear still is and inadvertently introduce potentially harmful garments. So suspend the thought of what you're thinking right now and just let's walk through what we're talking about and see where we end up at the end of this. So our standards know it matters. Uh, it, does not ma it does matter what you wear underneath your PPE. Don't wear anything that will melt, drip, or cause unnecessary injury. That is stated in 1975. That is echoed in, in 1500 when we're talking about what we wear underneath our turnout gear. In 1975, you have two options and two options, period. You either are in flame resistant station wear or you're in 100% cotton. What's the rationale there? Well, one, do we need to have the additional FR properties if we're buttoned up in our turnout gear? Will cotton suffice? And the simple and plain answer is absolutely yes. Under that narrow definition, completely buttoned up, that cotton, AKA latent fuel is not exposed. It will insulate and protect me as an additional layer in my turnout gear, as will FR. FR brings additional properties. You can argue back and forth if one's more insulative than the other, if one lends a little bit more to recovery because it's synthetic and the way it's built and the air permeability and all those things. But what we want to focus on is in our primary standard that talks about uh, work apparel, other than your turnout gear, you only have two options. You're either in flame resistant station wear or you're in 100% 1975 compliant cotton. That's it. Those are your only two options. 1500 echoes it and says in the, in the body, the part that you want to focus on, we echo what 1975 is saying. But if you read on a little bit further, and if you go into the appendix, which you can look at the NFPA 70 standards and look at all the different annexes and appendix and, and put, these are kind of the best practices. And, and this is very, very forthcoming. The very fact that members are firefighters indicates that all clothing that they wear should be inherently flame resistant to give a degree of safety if unanticipated happenings occur that expose the clothing to flame, flash, sparks, or hot substances. So where might that come into play? Well, if you look at uh, 
the calls that fire departments generally go on, what is the percentage in your firehouse? Is it 80% non-structural fires? Is it 90% non-structural fires? The actual firefighting def component on your business card is anywhere from 10 to 20% of your call. So that leaves a large percentage to where you may show up in your turnout gear, your primary protection, and you may be doffing that turnout coat. What do you wear underneath if it's exposed to unanticipated, aka accidental thermal exposures, where my industrial folks focus on accidental exposure, what is now your outermost layer? It's either fuel or it's not. Those are your only two options. As it said in 1975, you have options underneath your turnout gear. When you doff, take off that turnout gear, primarily your jacket, you now are, you either have fuel or you don't. And all 100% cotton is, is latent fuel waiting for enough energy. All 80, all 65, uh, 35 is, is meltables waiting for energy to make it melt, drip, and add to the injury. So we know our standards say it matters. We also show that independent data has found that what you wear underneath matters, either in insulating and protecting you or not and having you have more burn injury than you should have. And where we're able to extrapolate this information is from the Don Abbott Project Mayday. And during the years 2015 and 2017, Don took in roughly 4,300 submissions from uh, Mayday activities. And what they found is it correlates to what we're talking about is firefighters did get injured underneath their primary protection. In fact, about 585 or 14% of those 4,300 incidents that were reported to Don and his team, firefighters had significant burns underneath their turnout gear and survived. So the adage that if it ever gets so bad that I'm being hurt underneath my turnout gear, I am dead anyways, is, does not ring true. And where it does not ring true is we've got the data to show it. Also, when you look at Department of Labor, when you look at NIOSH, the use of polyester-based clothing increases the risk of severe burn injuries as it can melt under some emergency exposure conditions. So hold that thought as we move through. You require extensive and rigorous conformity to standards for the large majority of your PPE and especially your PPE that is fire facing, that outermost layer. Everything on your ensemble, whether you are researching it, specifying it, looking for the latest and greatest, whether manufacturers are building it, no one is building it to less than the nationally recognized consensus standards. So as we look at the standards, you can see and recognize all this equipment here. And some of these standards or all of these standards may pertain in one way, shape or form to give you tons of information. You definitely want them to meet those standards and ideally you would want them to exceed those standards. However, when it comes to what is closest to our firefighter, when it comes to their base layers and what they're wearing underneath that, we do have standards, but there does not seem to be any conformity or any uh, following. If you think about it from the numbers that we can look at, 400,000 career firefighters, just use that number because it makes for easier math and my limited gray matter. We have about 100,000 or one out of four uh, of those firefighters wear FR station wear. That means three quarters of them wear something other than. What we find is a large majority of other than are wearing synthetics and wearing synthetics that have no FR properties and those synthetics have very, very low melt points. And in fact, those synthetics are not allowed per the 1975 standard, but are utilized by firefighters all the time. So they are actually building a system from the inside out that is allowing meltables. If your primary function is working in a thermal environment, why would be what's closest to you be meltable? 
And that is the layering system that majority of firefighters are building upon. You are building your foundation upon meltables. So looking at this information, as we are learning about it, firefighters have choices. And the three choices are 6535 polycotton or polyester rich fabrics, 100% cotton and or flame resistant. So the bottom line is these are absolutely meltable and they're absolutely meltable in, in, in firefighting conditions. And we'll talk about these shortly. 100% cotton is good up until it is your outer layer, meaning you've doffed your primary for other than structural firefighting, and it could potentially lead to harm. So the only way to remove uh, incidental or accidental exposure or building upon your very sophisticated turnout gear and its layered system is to include the closest layer to you to also have FR engineering. FR layers eliminate two major problems. In a structural fire with full turnout gear, it removes any potential meltables from a variety of low cost polyester, polyester blends, whether that's polos, utility shirts, or worse yet, uh, performance gym wear. I mean, if you think about it, the klaxon goes off, you're in the uh, firehouse gym, you're knocking out some bench, some squat, whatever you are doing, throwing the sandbags around and you're sweating and you're wearing your performance gear and your next step is right into your turnouts. And for the large majority of what you may encounter on the fire ground, you're still going to be okay. But in those cases to where you go from ordinary to extreme, you may not be okay, and you're introducing a, a meltable into a thermal environment. Secondly, 80 to 90% of your calls are non-fire calls. And as we talk about doffing gears, it becomes deemed safe to do so. What if there's an incidental or accidental uh, thermal exposure to something that is either highly meltable, easily melted, or could potentially ignite? It happens. Now, for full transparency, this is not a firefighter. This comes from our industrial world where their outermost layer is a seven ounce work shirt that happens to have flame resistant and arc rated properties. It's not turnout gear. So all that radiant heat, all that UV, all that IR still passes through that outermost layer. It's not igniting, it's not melting, it's not dripping, it's not contributing to injury. Unfortunately, this young electrician was wearing that performance workout gear that you would wear in the gym because this was summer, it was hot, he wanted something that would wick moisture and keep him cool. That was 30 days in a burn unit having three and a half ounce polyester scraped out of his skin and those scars will be worn forever because that stuff has a very, very low melting point. And in an arc flash, you've got 2,200 square foot pounds of concussive force that drove that uh, molten plastic into his skin. That being said, it doesn't matter what I wear under my PPE because if it gets that bad, I'm dead anyways. How did we get that uh, thought kind of permeating through the fire services? Well, we kind of, as we looked and researched and we talked to folks, there is no mandatory database for recording uh, firefighter injury per se. Uh, most burn injuries obviously are kept very confidential. Uh, the wildly reported database on firefighters lends itself to uh, LODDs, and if all a firefighter ever hears about is, is, I have injuries, I have sprains, I have pulls, I have stuff because I see that in my colleagues, but anything beyond that is, is fatality, you start getting the mindset it's, it's either or, it, there's no gray area or there's no space in between to where I could just be hurt. So there's a lot of misleading information. And then a lot of folks really don't uh, follow the 1975 standards per se, when we look at 75% of firefighters are very, uh, uh, cavalier is kind of a, a strong word, but of what they wear next to them or underneath. So where did we get there? If a firefighter's primary PP is really good for normal working conditions, that, that's what uh, 1975, when they used to be all FR station wear and when they allowed 
cotton to be come into it. It was because turnout gear and bunker gear got so sophisticated that they weren't seeing the injuries. They weren't seeing the need for FR underneath. So we could go to something that's less expensive and equally insulative and does not factor into injury. And underneath turnout gear, underneath turnout gear worn in a fire environment and worn properly, that's exactly correct. Uh, so we look at that sophisticated system, that outer shell that's built to protect really your insulative layer and your moisture barrier uh, and have FR properties. Everything in here, all the way to the face cloth, 1971, all has FR properties. It's designed and it's been tested to what's my uh, escape factor. Because when we look at worst case conditions, when you look at flashover conditions, this is built to a rating of X to give me X amount of time to regress to safety. So when you get a number, if you look at a number such as 36, because it's easier to divide by two, you've got 18 seconds before second degree burn occurs underneath this very sophisticated insulative system. So it's not, it's not fireproof. It's not 100% zero injury. It will tell you under the worst conditions that you should experience, you have 18 seconds before you're gonna experience blistering on skin that's exposed underneath there. So that's what your TPP is. So when you look at a system that is a TPP of eight or a TPP of 40, that's 18 to 20 seconds before that second degree burn so you need to aggress and move forward and get out of that hazard. So if we look at the fire environment and how it's been changing with modern materials and construction, we are seeing flashover resulting earlier than in uh, years before. So as we evaluate what the hazard is, routine conditions, that's what we built turnout gear for. That's 400 to 500 degrees, one or two contents in a burning room. That is my office. That is where I go to work every single day. That's what's expected. That's what's on the business card. And that's what I'm doing. Ordinary conditions, it's a more serious fire, proximity to a room that's potentially flashing over, but still that's what my gear is built for. Extreme conditions, now we're in flashover. Now we are going from a working gear to survival gear egress to safety and, and move forward. So would it not make sense if we're looking at a changing fire environment, we need to change our approach or rethink the initial uh, intent of building that system from the base layer to your station wear and having FR properties all the way out. Would it not make sense if I am looking at a TPP of 38 and I added additional two layers to that have I now got a greater margin of error as opposed to having a meltable in there, like a 6535 uh, blended t shirt or 6535 uh, Dickies uh, cargo shorts versus 100% cotton, which, okay, I'm still okay. I've, it's not a meltable. I've got some insulation built in there. Would it not make sense to build that system from the inside out as opposed to the outside in? Because how much TPP or how much escapability do you really have? Under laboratory conditions, if I build a system to 36, I've got 18 seconds. If I build a system to 40, I've got 20. But what happens if I've been five to 10 minutes inside my routine and ordinary working environment? How much heat have I preloaded that system with? How much TPP have I taken away from my total egress time by normal working conditions before I reach flashover. If I have 18 seconds at flashover, that's one thing. But if I have preloaded that system after being in there for five to 10 minutes and then come across flashover, have I taken away any of that 18 or 20? Do I really only have nine or 10 seconds before I have a second degree burn? And then wouldn't it make sense to remove meltables? Wouldn't it make sense to get rid of that poly or that 100% synthetic undergarment? Because now it's going to be exposed to that thermal energy as it is migrating through my system. 
And we know this because we can take the same test methodology that we give you a TPP on and we can melt plastic. And that plastic under this is next to you. So I am taking polyester under the same TPP conditions and I am melting it to you. As you see, as we go through here, you go from open to compressed underneath uh, straps. Uh, if you're kneeling on something, elbows on something, uh, to where you now have full melted plastic that would be occurring on the firefighter's skin. That is what is open when you think about taking your system into your work environment and your work environment changes. You don't have the opportunity to go back and go, hey, I need to get out of this what I'm wearing underneath my turnout gear, I need to remove that because the situation is changing. What you wear in, you have to deal with as the situation or as the, the fire is changing and the repercussions can be minimal or they can be severe depending on how that station wear gets affected because of what it's built with. If you look at Nomex, which is the primarily used in FR station where there is zero effect. You cannot melt Nomex, Nomex cannot be ignited. Nomex will not ignite and continue to burn. It will not factor into in and of itself firefighter injury. We had a, uh, a huge incident uh, at the Boyd Street in uh, incident, uh, smokes and tokes and uh, I share this only because it is relevant to this conversation because you see a massive change in, in the fire ground. You see uh, the firefighters egressing from the roof as that fire conditions changed. Unfortunately, a number of them became trapped on the, uh, on the ladder, were exposed to a severe amount of thermal energy for an extended period of time. This is where their PPE went from uh, normal working conditions to uh, a life-saving device. And thankfully uh, that PPE uh, exceeded expectations, met expectations, however you want to look at it and did exactly what it was supposed to do. And all those firefighters uh, did survive. Now they were injuries sustained. And without dwelling on the actual how, where, why, and what of that, I want to lead it into more of a thinking situation. As our firefighters convalesced here, what do you notice about where the injuries are? You notice that there's a lot of injuries in and around the lower extremities, whether they're the legs and or the arms. And there can be a number of variables that factor into how that happens. Fire will find the least path of resistance and will enter up inside turnout gear. It will find its way into boots. It will find its way if you just are there long enough and it is hot enough. So this is not something where we can get 100% conclusive on. But what we can think of is if there was additional glare there, if they weren't wearing short sleeve Valor t-shirts, if they weren't wearing uh, short cargo shorts uh, underneath the things, could that additional layer of protection have helped to insulate and mitigate some of those burn injuries? So when we get beyond fire calls, when station wear becomes your primary PPE, it becomes the only layer between you and thermal uh, energy, that's that going back to NFPA 1500. That's going back to those unanticipated thermal exposures. Where can those happen? Whether they're EMS calls, vehicle accidents, water rescue, entrapments, building collapses, uh, you can go through a myriad of situations to where you can deem that area safe and because of the threat of uh, heat stress or other or better working conditions, you start doffing your primary PPE, you now have what's underneath as your primary PPE. And does it or does it not have FR properties? Is it fuel or is it not? And here we see, and it's not any judgment on anything, but you see firefighters who have doffed their uh, turnout gear in many occasions, many applications. You may have other first responders 
uh, on scene in areas to where you're trying to do something, they're trying to get uh, on there. Bottom line is it happens. Bottom line is that outer layer is now your primary PPE and does it or does not have FR properties? Will it melt or will it not? And I'm just gonna click through. And again, could we have accelerants in the water here? Could we potentially have a flash situation? Now you could argue that, that those t-shirts are so wet, there's no way they're gonna factor into the injury, but that's true if it was cotton, but if it was synthetic, whether it's wet or not, cannot, they can still melt at a very, very low flash point and cause injury. This is the ASTM 1930 test apparatus for us in the industrial world. It's also the thermal man apparatus that uh, has been widely used by DuPont to uh, show the difference between fabrics and how they perform and relatively short duration thermal exposures. Now for our firefighting community, if you are fully geared up, if you are in your turnout gear, whether it's 100% cotton, poly cotton, or it's FR is irrelevant until you get to extreme flashover conditions. What the mannequin would show here that would be relevant is if we have doffed our turnout jackets and we have whatever we have worn underneath uh, exposed. And if it is 100% cotton, that is latent fuel. It's about 400 degrees to ignite cotton. And once it's on fire, you're on fire and getting hurt. Poly cotton, about the same, a little bit less uh, thing, but you are definitely melting. And if you're not igniting, uh, those melting plastic is gonna cause injuries that don't need to. And obviously if we have FR engineering within our fabrics, we're self-extinguishing and we're mitigating any injuries from those accidental exposures. So implementation, using PPE correctly and effectively in the field. Uh, and this is interesting because, as I said, about one out of four firefighters is wearing FR. And a lot of the original premise behind doing that is one, they cost a little bit more, but they last longer. Uh, color fastness, they look better longer. And because of the way they're autoclaved and designed, they have a very strong professional image. You, you want to have your firefighters because you have other goals beyond just providing them work apparel. You want them to look good, you want them to be consistent in color, and you want that investment to have a decent ROI considering how expensive they are versus cotton, which will fade, it gets a little frumpy over time, and it's not as professional. So a lot of our departments chose those image reasons without really thinking of the additional safety layers. And where do we see this evident? When we talk to our firefighters and we ask them, you're wearing your very expensive FR station wear and the klaxon goes off, what is your first thing you do? Oh, I remove it. I get it off that done. I'm wearing my white t-shirt. I throw my turnout jacket, pants, good, I'm good to go. Why do you do that? Well, that's expensive. I don't want to damage it. I want it to continue looking good. So I take it off, remove it as I go to the active fire ground. So it's critical that you are reviewing the safety rationale of wearing that additional layer and not view it so much as a, uh, an image reason as something that you have to protect, AKA removing uh, your shirt that has additional FR properties and insulation uh, prior to going to the fire ground. So as we've stated, and, and really the paradigm that we're trying to change is instead of looking at your firefighting ensemble from the outside in, looking at all those standards and meeting all those standards from the fire facing components, start looking at your system from the inside out. What is closest to your firefighter, whether that's base layers, their actual shirts, pants, and then into their, their ensemble and have every additional layer providing protection uh, for your firefighter. So why? Why should we think that way? 
Well, the minimum standards for firefighters turnout gear requires that all layer from its outer shell to its face cloth must have FR properties and must demonstrate it can withstand the most extreme fire environment long enough for that firefighter to escape. Yet when allowed to make decisions regarding what's closest to the layer to their skin, firefighters choose for those FR properties to be optional. And in the majority of cases, allow uh, meltables which can and do cause unnecessary injury to be part of the system. So why? Why would highly skilled professionals whose work environment demands being outfitted with highly engineered and purposely built PPE, why would they allow garments that in that complex system of protection that can unnecessarily contribute to injury uh, when all the regulations and standards say don't do it? So when you have to care for this stuff, there's certain ways to do it. It's relatively simple. Uh, the care and maintenance of your station wear is in fact really easy because a lot of these fabrics uh, had their origin in the industrial world. And we've been carrying and maintaining those fabrics and those fiber complexes for over 50 years. And uh, we provide a lot of information on the labels to take care of them. It's not something that is complex. Uh, the written care instructions are relatively easy to follow. Most of these are common sense. The big ones are don't use bleach and peroxide in your system because those will weaken the fibers, which ultimately weaken their protection. Don't use any additives that would impede their, their performance. That's relatively easy to do. Uh, wash FR garments separately, not really from, from anything as far as cross-contamination to the actual PPE side of it, but cross-contamination too. If you were to take this stuff at home, you're, anything that you're bringing from home, you don't want to uh, include in, in your family's uh, gear. You don't want to put it on your non-FR clothing. If it's staying in the firehouse, it's relatively easy to do. Uh, turn things inside out for color retention. No brainer. Use liquid detergents for the best result. Avoid the hottest temperatures. You can uh, soak them for uh, tough stains. You can even dry clean them for, uh, for tough stains. Uh, tumble dry in low settings and they will take care of you for a long time. Uh, no endorsements from Tide. That was just the easiest one to pull. These are all the no-nos of the six items up here. The liquid detergent is the go-to. Like I said, easy to take care of, not complex at all. So as we start wrapping up and we start looking at having some time for QA, what if we start thinking of station, air, station wear as PPE and, and not uniforms? Uh, what if we eliminated shorts and short sleeves and Valor t-shirts? Uh, because we know and we see from the evidence that firefighters get a lot of burn injuries in layers that don't have, excuse me, in areas that don't have additional layers of protection. We can see it observationally. Uh, what if we had access to lightweight, comfortable PPE and that the right base layers and station wear can together actually assist in recovery? There's a lot of evidence being compiled right now that uh, FR station wear and the right blends can actually enhance and complement uh, recovery. And uh, we know from back-to-back -back studies of calls frequently having open night and having to don and doff the heavy gear during the hot environments, that additional stress on the body when it doesn't get time to recovery is also a huge factor of underlying conditions, et cetera. What if we were able to include base layers and station wear in the PPE budget as opposed to in the uniform budget? Just again, it's not something to where we can make this happen overnight. It's going to take a shift in mentality because it's taken a long time to get away from why we wore FR station wear to where we are today. It's gonna to take a long time uh, to get us back to thinking about protecting our firefighters from, from the inside out. But these are just, again, discussion starters, thought starters, uh, where can we go? So does it make sense to maximize, uh, that should probably say your turnout gear, uh, 
vis-a-vis -vis having stationware. Uh, we cannot say absolutely that an additional layer of protection and insulation will help every time. Um, in my 25 years, I've seen a lot of injuries. I've seen a lot of injuries that occurred when wearing PPE properly. I've seen a lot of injuries occur when they're wearing PPE and it's very haphazard. Uh, arc flashes, flash fires, uh, flashovers, these extreme conditions are unpredictable and it's case by case. Uh, but we do notice over time, you start to see consistency of where injuries occurred. And you can almost tell from looking at the PPE, from looking at the injuries, what was done right and what could have been done better. We see underneath uh, turnout gears when we see our firefighters where we're recording these uh, injuries, uh, they're in the lower extremities. They're in the lower leg, they're in the lower arms. Uh, obviously a lot of hand burns because of all the systems, the least amount of insulation happens many times in, in, in our gloves. Uh, many times in and around the back of the net, the old, the lower, where that lack of insulation uh, can come into play. But regardless of the thermal cause, whether it's scalding water, whether it's steam, whether it's contact or open flame or impingement, any of those, uh, would an additional layer have helped? Uh, even if that additional layer takes you from third degree down to second, second down to one and one down to zero, could it have had help? Uh, for someone who has gone through skin grafts, for someone who's experienced what that is like, it's not anything that you would wish on uh, your worst enemy, so to speak. Uh, it's not anything that you would want to have happen to you, uh, a colleague, a loved one. It is something that you would take out of the equation if you could. And could an additional layer of insulative FR built upon a system that is completely FR have helped mitigate that? Can you just knocking down third to second and second to first? Well, going from third to second, you take something that is will not heal up on its own, that's going to need skin grafts, it's going to take months to heal, is life altering, and you take that down to second, it's blistering. And it is will heal up on its own. It will take some time depending on the extent, but you will heal up on your own. Second to first, you're going from blistering to sunburn. And then from first to none, absolutely. So anything that you can not do to knock down in that system could ideally be beneficial. So can purposely increasing the layers of protection mitigate or eliminate body burn uh, as primary PPE reaches its structural and performance limits? I know in my industrial uh, worlds, we have to constantly refer and let our folks know that there is no magical properties in these flame resistant arc rated garments. We can't turn you into Superman. And even though the evolution of turnout gear has just from a quantitative standpoint has increased dramatically and it's only getting better, it still is limited. And there are areas to where it will actually fail and we need to have something built into that to ultimately protect our firefighters. So as takeaway thoughts, and again, these are thought starters, these are conversation starters. We're not gonna be able to change this paradigm overnight, but the one thing we can do is at least consciously, can we eliminate meltables? Can we take meltables out of our firefighters ensembles? And the, the easy answer is yes. Uh, even though cotton under certain conditions is not ideal, uh, it's still better than 65, 35 or 100% polyester. When we're looking at 1975, that's what it's speaking to. Can we eventually start to look at building into an FR system and having all the layers have FR properties? Well, that would be ideal, that would be perfect, but let's at least move away from meltables because thermal energy can and does penetrate turnout gear. We can demonstrate that all day long. Uh, firefighters do get burned out, burned inside their turnout gear and survive all the time, thankfully. Uh, what you wear next to your skin in certain conditions can hurt you. Uh, the standards say it matters, independent data says it matters, and the law 
says it matters. Um, when your station wear becomes your primary protection, how do you want it to perform when exposed to thermal energy? When you get outside of that primary protection, whatever you have underneath is now your PPE. How will it respond to an accidental exposure to thermal energy? Uh, station wear can help as PPE or hurt as a polyester uniform. You're either enhancing and complementing your primary PPE or you're not. And the question is, if you're not, why not? We know it matters. The evidence shows it matters. And we have to do better if we aren't currently today. So as I step off of my uh, small soapbox, I do appreciate you taking the time to think about this, taking the time to evaluate what has been said and uh, feel free. That is my new email. That is derek.sang at www.of.com, which is our workwear outfitters, which is our new name since ACPA, that's where Bulwark and where Work Right Fire Services fit under. Uh, feel free to, if we don't get to your questions today, or if you think about something uh, down the line, shoot me a note. I'd be more than happy to engage with you and better understand. As I said, I'm three to four years on the fire service side, and I'm looking at it from my 20 plus years on the industrial. And when I was first encountered fire services, and I looked at departments that weren't utilizing all the way to next to firefighter, uh, FR, I, I was, to be honest, I was taken aback just a little bit. Uh, my industrial community would not think twice about wearing FR all day, every day. And here I have the occupation of fighting fire, engaging with thermal energy at extended times in extended and elevated uh, heat formats, and they introduce multiples or are uh, non-FR alternatives underneath their primary gear. So it was a little bit of adjustment for me, honestly, and it's taken me a little bit to uh, get my head around, but the real message that we're getting out today is multiples do and can and will cause harm. And if we can remove those initially and work towards an end game, that's great. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Laura. Uh, we'll handle as many questions as we can in the next 13 minutes. And if we don't get to them all, the nice folks here send them to me and I will get you an answer to the best of my ability uh, when I get those. So with that, thanks for your time. Uh, well, thank you, Derek, for that very informative presentation. All right, questions, questions. Um, here's one for you. What is meant by a system approach to PPE? So think about a system, a systematic approach. Uh, when you have different ensembles that come together, it's really, it's our term of building that PPE from the inside out. It's a systems approach. So you have your base layers, which are going to be, for lack of a better descriptor, your undergarments. Then from there, you're gonna have your station wear or what you normally wear around the firehouse prior to the klaxon going off. And then you have your 1971 ensemble. So base layer, 1975, 1971, they're all independent of themselves and then together they would be a system. So it's just our way of describing what the approach should be to when you're building your PPE. It should be a systems approach from the inside out. Okay, and... What, um, again, perhaps what evidence there is that station wear fabric matters? Well, the evidence is not easily found. And it would be great to have that silver bullet to just point everybody to the burn data, everybody to uh, the injuries and say, hey, here's what it is, now do this. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. So we have to extrapolate because when we talk to our, our, our burn nurses and when we talk to the folks that handle both our industrial and our firefighters, 
they don't care what your PPE is. Uh, they're getting you out of everything and they're starting to evaluate you, triage you, and they're looking to get temperature down. They're doing all the magic that they're going to do in that uh, emergency room to start mitigating how much of you is starting to cook off. That being said, that big pile of uh, clothing that's sitting in the corner, uh, does it get evaluated? Sometimes we get feedback Sometimes we don't. We are able to extrapolate, though, when we talk to our uh, nurses in that in recovery of where these injuries primarily occurred. We know that firefighters, if they're wearing T-shirts underneath, we'll see burn injuries on the, the next layer of skin. Even though that's a lightweight cotton T-shirt, it was enough of an insulator to protect it from getting second degree burns to where the unprotected areas did receive injuries. We do know, and there, are, there is evidence of, and you saw in the NIOSH study that 6535 absolutely unnecessarily contributes to injury. I mean, if you think about it, if you have a three and a half ounce, 100% polyester meltable, and you reach flashover conditions, and you have X amount of seconds before there's enough thermal energy to blister your skin, what do you think that thermal energy is gonna to do to three and a half ounce, 100% polyester? It's definitely gonna interact with it and it's definitely gonna start doing what? It's gonna melt it and shrink it. So all that heat that goes into that three and a half ounce is now being compressed even tighter against the firefighter's body. And it's now starting to melt. I mean, so, you only need less than two seconds for a second degree burn and you've got molten plastic sitting on your skin. Even if you manage to aggress to safety, now that turnout gear is an insulator to what? That plastic cooling off. So it's gonna remain hot until you can start doffing your turnout gear to get that away from you. It doesn't take long to extrapolate that injury is going to occur from something that is melting underneath your turnout gear. Can we melt it? Absolutely all the time in the laboratory. It's easy to do. And, we, and that same test methodology that gives you your TPPE, I can put polyester underneath there, flip it over, take that ensemble, start heating it up, and within... Uh, 20 to 24 seconds, I have melting plastic. So we know that it can occur. All right, thank you, Derek. Got a couple more questions here for you. In the Boyd Street fire, do you know what, on the fire, what the firefighters were wearing under their PPE? It was very hard to see exactly from, uh, we saw the turnout gears that were taken aside. Uh, on all the information that we've been able to talk to, we just listened to the Boyd Street, uh, the webinar. As we, the best indicator was, is as we looked at their fellow firefighters on the fire ground after the fire was knocked down, they had doffed their turnout gear coats. And you could see their suspenders and you saw a variety of white t-shirts. You saw some Valor t-shirts and you saw a, a short sleeve work shirt, which very well could have been uh, FR. So I'm going to extrapolate that it's all of the above. That like in many firehouses, uh, as they responded to that call, they were in various uh, ways of dress. Some may have doffed a, a, a FR as I talked to their FR uh, station wear and had a white t-shirt. Others would have been in their Valor t-shirts. If we take that and we extrapolate that to the crew that was on the roof and that encountered all that energy, and then we look at where they were injured, we can say probably short sleeve t-shirts, probably cargo shorts, and definitely none of them were FR. Whether they were uh, whether they were 65, 35 or combination of no idea in all honesty, but I could make a strong case that looking at their colleagues, looking at their injuries and saying that the layer, areas where they were burned the most were areas that there was no protection. It was turnout gear and then skin. All right, thanks, Derek. 
And do you, on the heels of that, any insight on why manufacturers provide short sleeve FR uniforms? Because firefighters buy them. <laughs> yeah, that's an answer. Um, all right, I think that's all the questions I've got come in. I think that, uh, let's give another moment here. Yeah, I think we can probably wrap it up. Well, no problem at all. Laura, thank you for your time. And again, to the audience, thank you for their participation. And hopefully they'll give uh, some firehouse talk around some of these talking points. And uh, it's greatly appreciated. Thanks again. Absolutely. Great presentation, Derek. And that does conclude our webinar on selecting and caring for your station wear. We hope everyone's enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to Derek um, and Workright Fire Service for your support and efforts in bringing this valuable information to Canadian fire departments. Remember, a copy of this webinar will be sent to you within 24 hours. Take care, everyone, and have a great day.